written from, we're, called, we're, um, we're holding space to acknowledge the indigenous people and that relationship that we have with our lands. And especially as it relates to this work, when we think about those that we have lost, those that we've searched for, they're, they're resting in our lands, in our waters. And we hold that uh, relationship back to our creation. And, and so we want to acknowledge that and hold that space for indigenous people and to also think about your relationship to this place. How do you, what brings you to this land? And if you're a relative of, uh, I'm zooming in from Anchorage. This is the homeland of my relatives, the Dena'ina. And so I want to say chinan to them for holding that original stewardship into, from the past and into the future. And also think about your relationship if you're a visitor to these lands and how are you holding space for indigenous people and how are you an ally? So again, I'd like to say chinan, masicho, kuyana, gunalchish to all of the indigenous people who have been and continue to be the stewards. And with that, I'd like to welcome you all and to continue our grounding, um, I'd like to invite Yari to come um, into the space. Yari, you're muted. I apologize. Thank you, Rochelle. Welcome everybody and, and thank you for joining us to this very special event here which is very sacred to all of us. I would like to open with a song, with a prayer song that was passed down through generations. And my people sing this song. And my ancestors once told me that, that I should keep singing our songs so I could keep healthy and strong. So when I sing the song, that's what I think about. So I'm gonna do this as a opening prayer. singing that song as I was praying I saw our ancestors from different parts of Alaska wearing all their regalia and I want you to know that they are in our spaces and they are here with us right now they have joined us so I welcome our ancestors to our space and next I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Kelsey Waka a jugo tunga, mamtre saramiunga, denaina asnenya miwita tunga. Hi everyone, my name is Kelsey Jugan Wallace. I'm originally from Mamtre Sak, but I currently live and work here on Dena'ina lands. I have the pleasure of working alongside these incredible ladies um, with the MMIWG2S Alaska Working Group. Uh, about two years ago, this working group came together because we saw a need for um, for community organizing, for advocacy, for healing when it comes to issues such as our missing and murdered loved ones. And so folks um, from Native People's Action and Native Movement uh, came together. And then since then, it has grown to include folks, incredible leaders, incredible um, advocates from 
Data for Indigenous Justice, the Alaska Native Heritage Center, and also the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center. This group meets um, every week for about two hours to discuss the things that we hear directly from our community, you know, where the gaps are in protecting our people and how we can organize to serve our community and work collectively towards justice. We also cover issues such as uh, policy gaps and advocacy areas that we feel folks can um, enter into this work. And we do this with, in a really, really good way with the focus of healing for not only our communities and our people, but also for ourselves as folks who work um, on this issue, whether that is in working groups, whether that is um, you know, advocates within our communities, policymakers, healing is really at the forefront of this um, healing for our health and well being and safety of our community members. And so I just want to extend a real big koyana and thank you to uh, all of my, I like to call them my sisters who do this work. Um, and just give them a, a big virtual wraparound hug. And I can't wait till I can hug you guys all in person. Um, and Boyana Yari for grounding us in such a good way. I know that um, that is needed. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Kendra to introduce herself too. Thank you, Kelsey. And yes, I can't wait till we can be in person and hold these meetings and give you all hugs. I miss you all. Um, Kendra Kloster, I'm the Executive Director of Native Peoples Action, Native Peoples Action Community Fund. I am originally from Wrangell and Juneau, although I live here on Dena'ina lands in Anchorage. My favorite role I always get to brag about is being a mama and I got two small kiddos and that really grounds a lot of our work and puts so much heart into it as we're working on this this issue and many others is knowing that we're trying to make this a more safe and loving place and coming from our indigenous you know, for our children and for our future generations and um, whenever we have those tough days and i know we all have them is you know we just go and we hug our babies or maybe your fur babies and your friends and our family and we do this work together. So yes, I appreciate all of you and I appreciate those that are tuning in and are being our partners um, in this work as well. So and I'm going to pass it over to Rochelle. Good things are coming today. Shojrit Rochelle Adams Oji, which I jet at Tendu Kotanisi, Jok Anchorage Wichi, Dilak Nai, Dena Ina Nai, Nanko Anditi, Jok Drin Shidri Slash Ronch and the Hulst in Shoisi, um, Shogutra Tugwals in Trinja Nai, Nich Ip Nai, so Masi. Hi everyone, my name is Rochelle and what I said in my language of which in is uh, I'm originally from the villages of Fort Yukon and Beaver and I'm living here now in Anchorage on the homeland of my relatives at Dena'ina and I get to work with these amazing women and the work that we do is for the women and the girls and it's really important work and for our relatives that have gone missing so I'm honored to work with these women and um, to carry the voices of our people from across the state and the voices of our loved ones and to honor those that have gone missing or been murdered. And so it's heavy work. We do this with love and um, just really glad to be here today. And I really appreciate all of you that are joining us today. So I'll pass it over to Akpik. Lota Kovanga Charlene Akpak, Mexiska Akpik, Chinik Mugurunga, Suli Kachirvik Mugurunga, Akaka Sandra Baby Lu Apak, Ichnega Evan Lukan, Savaktunga Native Movement Me, Suli Data for Indigenous Justice Me. So, good afternoon. My name is Charlene Apak, and my new name is Akpik. 
Um, my family is from Golovan in White Mountain, Alaska. My mother is Sandra Baby Lou Upuk, and my son's son is Evan Luplan. I'm zooming in from Denina Lands here in Anchorage. Um, I work at Native Movement as a Gender Justice and Healing Director, and I'm also the Executive Director for Data for Indigenous Justice. So Paklovitsi, welcome, and I'm going to pass it to my colleague Maritza. Um, thank you all for being here today. My name is Marissa. My Inupiaq name is Kevark. Um, I live and thrive on Dinah Inna lands. I have two beautiful babies, and so this work is very important to me, and I'm very grateful to have met all of these lovely women. Um, so I look forward to our discussion today, and, and I guess that leaves us to Deborah next. So thank you all for being here. Goodness, Chish, Maritza, and it's a pleasure also um, to be here. My name is Deborah O'Gara. My Clinket name is Dejuksuk. I'm Clinket and Yupik from my my uh, people are originally from Wrangell and from Mountain Village up on the Lower Yukon River, and I am zooming in here um, from um, another Clinket village called Petersburg, which the Norwegians like to claim, but um, we click and click are still here. So um, I am the policy specialist for the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center and I am thrilled to be working with this group of, of women who um, are tirelessly working to bring information to you and I'm, I'm also very excited to see so many people um, that have zoomed in to see um, what our message is today. And I am going to pass this um, introduction portion over to um, Yari for her to introduce herself. I am a Kayuri of Sekamoku City, La Rashkesi, Wanga Yupi is Junat Kayari, Sibo among Pingunga Sibo among Aymaram Kanam to Sandaman Wan and Tari Kaunga Manta Konga Honi Dena in Ahmed Nunangi. My name is Yari. I am originally from St. Lawrence Island from the village of Sivunga, and my clan is Aymaram. And my sub clan is Sandramango, and I live and breathe on the lands of the Dinaina people. So I'm very grateful that they allow us to live here on their lands. So I always teach my children that we are guests here on their land. And so I'd like to say, This work is very, very important. It's very sacred. And so I'm going to ask that you guys put good thoughts and good energy into this whole entire event, and also to MMIWG. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Malia. Jamai Waka, good afternoon. I'm very honored to be with you all today. Koyana to Yari for starting us off in a good way. Um, I'm based here in Tacoma, Washington on the lands of the Puyallup uh, Nation. Uh, my partner is uh, Laura Elwa Klalam. I am uh, Alutik Shukbiak with family from the islands of uh, Kodiak and of in Alaska and Oahu and Lanai and Hawaii. We have a 10-month-old son um, and three stepdaughters. I uh, serve as a tribal council member with the Native Village of Afognak off the coast of the Kodiak and uh, the Senior Vice President for Community Investments with the Afognak Native Corporation, formerly with the National Congress of American Indians, where we helped to do some of the VAWA re reauthorization years ago. And very honored to speak with you and to learn more about this community of people today. Koyana. And I will pass to Akpik, I believe. Hey, Koyana. So as you all can see, we have, I love the strengths of this group. Not only do we have different cultural heritages and backgrounds, but we also have amazing diversity of skill sets that we bring together to do this work. And today we are focusing on having a policy form and understanding the implications for policy. So go ahead and share my screen for our PowerPoint. Hopefully you all can see it. Perfect. Um, and I'm going to just provide a quick overview for this in case this is a new topic for you all. 
Oops, I guess my arrow is on my computer. There we go. Um, so this issue of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and Who Spirit Relatives is a national problem across Indigenous countries and nations. Um, and there are some, there's so much complexity to this issue. And again, today we're really going to hone in on some of the policy aspects. Um, but this is a problem that originates from colonization and has and is due to racism and sexism. Um, there is so much that goes into this and often one of the things that you'll hear our group say is that we're seeking justice on every front and so you'll see us put out a lot of initiatives and this again is going to have a policy focus today. Earlier today I did a whole presentation just on the data. Um, so there's so much to every single topic um, and it's such a big problem and it is here in Alaska and across other indigenous communities. And there's some big buckets of information um, on understanding the problem. So there's a lack of protections across indigenous communities for women and our girls. And there's some really um, sobering statistics. For Alaska, we're in the United States, we have the highest rate of murder of females by males um, in the whole country. And in some areas, the murder rates are 10 times higher than non-natives for Alaska Native an American Indian women. Um, missing in data, and that's again a whole nother conversation um, that we're going to share a little bit about on the next slides, but in short there's a lack of mandates and um, required reporting, and so it's very hard to be represented in data. And we're missing in the media, so not only are we missing our loved ones in person and from our families and our communities, but we're missing coverage on making this a big issue where everyone is aware of it. We have so many people outside of Indigenous communities who aren't aware of what's happening. And so there's so many um, contributing issues to this, but again, we're gonna um, focus in on um, some particular issues today. Um, I do wanna provide just a little bit of the data for um, folks who might need that information, especially when making decisions around policy. But first and foremost, we know that when we enter the conversation of data that we're really talking about loved ones. We're talking about women and girls and families and dreams and hopes, and it isn't just numbers. And so each figure that we talk about and when we talk about this, we humanize and we know that um, these are truly people that are longed and missed and loved very, very much. Um, the next slide. So just last month, Data for Indigenous Justice was able to release the first Alaska-specific report. Um, and again, this is a pretty important resource for us to be able to say what's really happening in our communities. And so I want to recognize Malia, Dr. Malia Villegas is here on this call, um, and the other board members, Jody Potts and Abigail Echohawk, who are co-authors of this work, and it can be found online. Um, but previously, the data that we had from 2018 from Urban Indian Health Institute was um, we had 52 cases. And with 52 cases, we were the fourth highest state. Just a couple of years later, since we've been taking care of and stewarding this data, we just released this figure that there's a total of 229 missing and murdered indigenous women and girls here in Alaska. And this is just what is documented. Um, so we can share that resource later if you have more questions, but I just wanted to give an overview of the information that we have at hand to work with when making policy decisions. And then I'm going to pass it to Kendra and just let me know when you need the slides proceeded. Okay, sounds good. So I just um, I'm going to start by saying we're going to talk a little bit about the policy that's in the state legislature. Um, we could do a, a whole other presentation on what's happening on the federal side. Um, so maybe at another date that we can do that. There's lots of moving pieces as Akpek had stated. Um, so the data and also looking at the policies, working with our communities to move these things forward. So for those, I know we've got some folks from the legislature that are joining us, so we just wanted to highlight 
um, House Bill 38 um, by Representative Zolkowski. So really appreciate you know, her work in putting this forward. It has a few pieces to it, which is establishing government to government relationships with the tribes. And this is related on how DPS, Department of Public Safety, um, Police Standard Council is gonna be working with our tribes and trying to establish that um, within statute. And this is important because a lot of our tribes, you know, are doing this work. And we know that working together is gonna to be the best way to be protecting our communities. And that not every solution is going to be the same in, in every region. So it's really important that we have those government to government relationships. Uh, we're, this legislation would also um, create um, liaisons within the Department of Public Safety and standardized methods for investigations. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So in the, you know, in this work, and I know that we're gonna, you know, talk about more of the things that we can do, but as a working group, we came together and have been doing outreach to our communities, to our tribes on what other kinds of things that we can be doing um, through state legislation. And we look forward to having a hearing and so we can talk about the bill in more detail, how it's gonna work, but also how, what are some other things that we can work on putting together as well. So as I mentioned, this working group, um, we got together and we've been doing a lot of different work. And some of the things that we have talked about, we've talked with other legislators, um, we've talked with um, Department of Public Safety, we've been talking with um, Anchorage Police Department and others in crafting these different ideas and with our um, tribes as well. So requiring ongoing racial equity trainings for law enforcement. Um, it's really important for, for our law enforcement to understand what the indigenous communities, our values are and beliefs and just really working together. And it's just so important that these racial equity trainings are going to be implemented. And I know that there are some kind of cultural trainings now and we really need to be enhancing those. And so that's why we've been working with the different departments, with the Anchorage Police Department and saying, how can we improve? Because right now, um, for the new recruits that come in, they get a one-time training and it is not comprehensive. It is short. Um, we've seen some of it. It really needs um, an overhaul. And we're talking with them now, but you know, it needs to be more than that. It needs to be across the state. And I guess one other thing before I move on with that is doing it so in a meaningful way. So making sure that we're working, you know, with indigenous led organizations, um, whether it's going to be nonprofits or our tribes to really develop um, the right trainings. Um, audits and reporting on law enforcement, um, oversight committee for a missing and murdered indigenous women cases. Something else that I had mentioned is we really need to be looking to our tribes and working with our communities in a meaningful way and allowing them to have the ability to put in what I need. It could be increased public safety, but it could be other things. It could be other programming. And so that's why we wanted to establish a grant program for tribes that allows direct funding to communities so they can use the funding in ways that make the most sense for them. We need to support more research and data collection. We know, and in my time in the legislature, when we present bills and policies, one of those first questions that is asked, what, what is the research and what is the data? And people wanna know when they're passing those policies, but there needs to be support to get that, um, to get that done so you can make those, those decisions. And you know, I so appreciate the work that Data for Indigenous Justice is doing. It is so needed. Um, but I think, you know, being able to support them to and others that are doing this really important work um, needs to be um, funded, needs to be recognized by the state. And I hope that people here on this um, that are joining us today will reach out and get that more specific information. And I, I know we've got other presentations that we'd love to share with you and Ockpit can give some more information and pass that report along as well. 
and then review of prosecution and judicial outcomes. And that's also really important. We need to understand what's happening. We need to get information. And I think Deborah's going to touch a little bit more on this and some other policies that are so important. So this is just some things related to MMIWG directly. Um, but later on the presentation, Deborah's going to talk more about some of the overall policies that really um, interconnect because we need to be looking at public safety as a whole and numerous different things that we can be doing and that's you know the 911 system and and multiple other things so I won't um, get into that right now and take over Deborah's talk but she's got some amazing um, ideas that I can't wait for her to share as well but I do want to encourage everyone to to be following along with that bill to reach out to Representative Zalkowski and be a partner and be an ally and ask how can we you know help get this bill passed and get it over the finish line and I know a lot of us um, our organization stand ready to be helpful in any way possible so goodness chi chawa and I'm trying to look at my notes to see who goes next <laughs> Oh, oh, great. Okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Malia. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. I, I know I was supposed to be on with uh, one other panelist, and so um, I uh, was looking forward to that engagement, but I'm going to do my best to give an overview and then to, to really work to engage with this community um, today. Um, really what I thought I'd share is in kind of bringing in some of the recommendations from the data for Indigenous justice um, report, uh, some of those recommendations towards the end is really uh, the framework of crafting an Alaska state policy agenda to address missing and murdered Indigenous women, women and girls. So that's really what I want to just invite some thinking around today. We've already got some great foundation on that front. Um, but for me, there are two bookends to that, how, how we go about crafting an Alaska state uh, policy agenda. And the first is really understanding what federal policy prioritizes. What are we seeing at a federal level? Um, and there are a couple of uh, pieces of legislation that recently moved through, the first being the Not Invisible Act of 2020. And I want to specifically highlight that in terms of our effort in the state of Alaska, because it uh, intends to create a new position in the Interior Department on murdered, missing, and trafficked Native people. Many of you may be following the confirmation of uh, Deb Halland, um, and she has, as a representative, uh, championed a lot of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, legislation. So we have a feeling we're going to have uh, a very big advocate um, in thinking with uh, that Interior Department, should she be confirmed, about what that new position could be. It also works to create a new joint Interior and Justice Department Advisory Committee. So to work cross-agency here uh, to figure out what some of those uh, initiatives could be, how to work with states, um, and how to uh, get resources to uh, communities working to address these issues. The other is the Savannah's Act, our public law 116-165. Uh, and in that act, that um, light different provides training for law enforcement on how to record tribal enrollment, as well as for the public in relation to using national databases that already exist, like NAMUS, which is the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. Um, so there's resources there around training and engaging with the public. It also uh, requires the Department of Justice to develop regionally appropriate guidelines for response to cases of missing or murdered uh, Native people. And that one, I think, in particular, is really important for us to pay attention to, that they're going to be uh, looking to regions around what is important uh, to us and what sorts of guidelines could be critical. And so um, I'm a big fan of uh, federal government assisting where uh, possible, but also figuring out a way for us as a state to come together and say, as you're working to roll out uh, federal policy that helps to uh, support what's happening with missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, these are the things that are important to us. So really want you to uh, just be aware of that as part of what we could look to. 
At the same time we examine these federal priorities, we must acknowledge, however, that much of these are unfunded mandates. They set out a, a policy priority, but they don't come with associated resources. So we really have to think intentionally at a state level. Yet at the same time, we have another huge champion in our place, in our state, and that is Senator Lisa Murkowski, who has really been a champion for these efforts. And I believe that if we can really organize at a state level, which I know uh, a lot of those pieces are coming together, um, if we can do that and set out our priorities and expectations, I believe she and others will come uh, to assist with that federal to state interplay there. So I think that's one piece is understanding what uh, is going on at the federal level. But the other piece is identifying what Alaska's strengths and challenges are with respect to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. The We Are Calling to You report that uh, Data for Indigenous Justice put out and the recommendations, I think, provide a starting point. That was our hope. Uh, we have seven recommendations in the report, uh, but today I'll just highlight uh, two. Um, the first is really that we need consistency in data collection and reporting. Um, can we develop guidelines at a state level for what is expected of law enforcement when an Indigenous woman is reported missing or murdered? When you say it like that, it sounds pretty plain and, and straightforward, but it's very complex and there are a lot of layers to that. And so what I have done in the past, I definitely don't like to start with a blank slate. I think we have to look at who's doing what well where and try to work with them and model as we get closer to best practices. So I wanna offer the other states we are watching and how they organize around addressing missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. It was our intent that this report would stand alongside and acknowledge other work that had gone before and uplift other states that are and communities that are trying to build uh, similar reports and initiatives. And so uh, Minnesota, Nebraska, Arizona, Wyoming, and Montana are a few uh, that have either de developed reports or state level initiatives and legislation that we think could be useful as we develop a, a statewide policy approach. In Montana, in fact, just yesterday on our board call, we learned about uh, one of the only, I think the only uh, pilot initiative that the Salish and Kootenai tribes in Montana have launched with the Department of Justice. Um, uh, and their work, their initiative is really about generating best practices around creating a response plan in missing persons cases. So how, you know, exactly in relation to this question, what happens when indigenous women or girl, uh, woman or girl is uh, reported missing uh, or murdered? How do they respond? What is the communication? Who's involved? And the intention with that uh, pilot project is to have a model that can be shared with other tribes, with other communities working on this issue. So we don't wanna start um, you know, from, from, uh, from nowhere here. We have some examples. We have some folks who are doing work that we can already look to. But this piece around consistency in data collection reporting, you already heard mentioned. And we have some specific um, examples uh, and asks in relation to that around race, ethnicity, tribal affiliation and getting to consistency there, as well as looking at uh, location and where our people are coming from. A lot of times the reporting is done at, a, um, at an urban kind of space where people have come to, but doesn't give uh, acknowledgement of where that person came from in terms of home location. We know we have a lot of homelessness on uh, transient people coming to town for uh, health, family, schooling, many different reasons. And so being able to, to capture more intentionally so that we can uh, look at community links and, um, and family and supports, as well as the dynamics. What, what is uh, causing some of this that we can help to address? And then we have some language in here about updating sex and gender fields to be more inclusive. So again, encourage you to take a look at that report as a starting point um, for how to get to some consistency. I know there are several staffers and legislators on the call and we definitely wanna be a resource in crafting some of this legislation and policy guidelines on this front. And then the second um, recommendation that I'll just highlight uh, beyond the consistency in data collection and reporting is to mandate name us entry. Uh, name us again is the national um, missing uh, unidentified uh, database, uh, NAMUS. 
and at least eight states uh, have passed legislation already mandating case entry into that national database. Uh, states like Oklahoma, New Mexico, Tennessee, New York, Michigan, Illinois, Arkansas, and West Virginia, a whole different set of states. So we're talking about at least 15 to 20 states who are making really amazing progress on this front and have great examples of how we could craft that legislation and policy to help support our law enforcement in reporting into the NamUs so we can help track and uh, address this issue more intentionally. So just in conclusion here, you know, it's hard in this work sometimes to not simply focus on the challenges and the gaps that we have when many of us uh, no, we have organizations in Alaska with amazing capacity to help address complex challenges. Many of you are on, you are community leaders, Native Peoples Action, and others uh, who are with us today or in partnership uh, around this issue. We have organizations that know how to provide cultural training, as was mentioned by Kendra, to provide support for families and communities. We know how to do that, to develop data and data systems to track and understand difficult dynamics. I'll never forget a, a data palooza I was a part of when President Obama was in office. He was, a, they called him the science president. He said his, his favorite uh, event was the National Science Fair every year. He was a data geek like many of us. He loved the numbers, loved to see young people engage with data and story. And he convened a series of data events around the country to uh, address, to leverage data in support of really complex community ch challenges. And uh, communities put forward teams, um, and we worked on very hard questions. And, you know, there's a little competition, nothing wrong with a little healthy competition to push forward, um, you know, what uh, many may see as very dull kind of policy work, but we, we brought uh, some good positive energy to it. And so I don't know if we want to think about something like that, a community level data challenge or policy challenge where we can bring together the best minds, the best hearts, and the best resources together to address some of these efforts in that way. I think we can, we can leverage and, and build together in this. So, you know, in the same way, I guess we are calling for our state system in this report to articulate clear system responsibilities in Alaska for addressing MMIWG we also, as community, have an opportunity and a responsibility at our level to determine what part each of us in our organizations and roles will contribute to that effort. So pointing that mirror both, both directions. So I'll end there with my, my formal remarks, um, but certainly want to invite you as part of the conversation to communicate with us at Data for Indigenous Justice, what kinds of data needs you have as we move forward with our agenda and our uh, carrying our water on this, uh, on this work. Ayanna Shinak for the time. Thank you, Malia. Uh, I so appreciate you being here. I appreciate your work. Um, I can't uplift you enough here in everything that you do. And just so many points that are so right on, you know, and yeah, I, I become speechless <laughs> in just all these things that are going on and doing this work together. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things. You mentioned the report. We're going to drop in the chat the report so everyone can take a look at it. And please feel free to reach out to us, to anyone here, um, if you want more information. And I'll you know, try to get some information out, um, maybe via email as well, so you can have a copy of the report. And you gave some, you know, you're seeing some really specific examples here of things that we can be doing in the state legislature, um, within our communities, and, and the federal side as well. So I'm going to implore everyone again to take a look at this information and figure out how we can work together and be moving moving some solutions forward. Um, so from now, again, I appreciate you being here. And I'm going to pass it over to Deborah. Okay, goodness, Sheesh, thank you. And thank you, um, Malia, for all that great information. Um, it was really helped. And with the, um, with the data and the overview, plus what, what um, the overview on, on the current bill um, that is in legislation from um, legislatures uh, from Kendra, um, we can see what's there. I am going to go over um, a, a four things 
briefly before we um, have a chance to open it up for discussion, questions, and answers. I am having a great time reading everybody's comments, uh, not only where you all are from, but also just comments about what's going on in your area. So um, please keep that, that um, coming. Um, there's two particular bills um, that have also been to introduce that we want to highlight, Senate Bill 81. Um, which is up on the screen. It is um, entitled Village uh, Public Safety Officer Grants. Essentially what it does um, is require, and you know, for some of us, this would be a no brainer. This should already be done and shouldn't even require a bill to require it. But um, um, there you have it. Um, this bill would require um, background, criminal background and um, um, checks on every each and every applicant who applies for a VPSO position um, and uh, um, often this is done through the Department of Public Safety we are asking um, with this bill um, for folks to support it and to um, impose it as well as the other things that are already being discussed um, in in the other bills um, the other bill um, is uh, Senate Bill 63. Um, Senator Bishop has introduced this. Um, and this one would, um, this one has run into a little bit of um, some questions and some concerns. It seems on the face of it to be really um, important. It is um, helping to provide an aid for, um, for those who are attempting to find missing persons. Um, and there's no, um, there's no limit on this um, as far as um, who is missing, just anybody who's missing. Um, and what it allows is for um, any interested person to go into the state court system and ask for a temporary guardianship over the person for the um, sole purpose of looking into their financial and uh, phone records for the purpose of attempting to locate uh, where they might be. There's been some concerns raised on this um, primarily, and, and I think um, this bill is, it can be um, a good bill with some safeguards in there as to maybe who is the interested person. What we wanna do is make sure that that interested person who's attempting to get the temporary guardianship is also not the abuser and that it's um, that the missing person is not necessarily a domestic violence or sexual assault victim who's actually attempting to disappear or get away from um, his or her abuser. So with those safeguards, I think this would be um, good. Uh, um, at first, I was a little concerned about this because it, because it also seems to be putting family when in fact that should be a job of law enforcement but in the long run i think all of us who um, are involved who have uh, friends or family who have disappeared we want to do everything that we can to help find them and this would be one avenue to, for doing that so in that way it's it's good the third thing i wanted to mention is a 911 system for those of you who live here in alaska you know we don't have outside of the few um, urban areas that we have like Juneau, Anchorage, Fairbanks um, and such, um, there's, there does not exist a statewide 911 system. And this system helps to um, provide not just um, emergency assistance um, in the form of law enforcement coming in and actually being there on the spot, but it also helps to um, get local folks um, to be able to respond to emergencies that um, exist. Um, the Department of Public Safety actually has um, studied and come up with a plan that has been introduced and would um, essentially, if implemented, save the state millions of dollars if implemented. There are certain um, folks um, legislators or business people, and um, I actually, i um, not sure exactly who, but when this um, uh, idea of implementing a statewide 911 system was introduced, it was actually shelved as um, not practical and um, no questions asked and has not been returned. 
um, not only would this system save lives, it would save money. And it is unbelievable that um, it continues to be shelved. And um, the more we can talk about um, needing a 911 system and attempting to get either the plan that's already been put together off the shelf or another plan, or just talking about the need for a 911 system for the benefit of um, providing emergency services and um, assistance for those across the state, uh, particularly in our um, rural areas with assistance. And then the last thing um, Kendra was um, talking about um, is the, and this is a, um, an issue that we are still gathering information, and I say we as in our working group and many other organizations across the state are working on or looking into um, the lag, lag in time on um, prosecutions by the Department of de Prosecution decisions by the Department of Law, which is um, our, who, who supervises our criminal prosecution throughout the state. There is a decline of prosecutions after um, months and months and months. We heard about um, just recently a case up north where the prosecution um, was uh, provided with all the investigative reports from a murder of a, an indigenous um, person up north. Um, that investigation, which had been completed with a suspect, um, sat on the prosecutor's desk for approximately two years, with um, at which point in time the prosecution then made the determination that they would not pursue prosecution and close the case. Now, that's <clears throat> one extreme case, but I think um, essentially if we start really delving into um, this issue, there's going to be a lot more cases. Prosecution that um, um, gets declined simply because the prosecutor doesn't think that they will win um, at, um, at trial is a disservice to um, our relatives who are being murdered. And this involves um, not just homicide, but also um, severe fel felony level um, assaults and sexual assaults. So we want to start also bringing in bringing this issue up and talking to the um, state. Um, we're, we're looking into is this a issue that we can bring to the state legislature or is this the issue, an issue that we bring directly to the governor who appoints the um, state attorney general and um, who oversees the Department of Law. So we've got, um, there's, so there's a lot of avenues um, on that. And again, it's one of the issues that we just wanna start bringing light to that and start collecting data on that, much as we, um, as you've seen um, with the data collection on just our numbers for missing and murdered. Um, uh, indigenous women and, and uh, relatives. Those were the four things that I wanted to bring and I am going to um, now pass it over to um, Kelsey. This is, yep, this is me. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep my camera off because my connectivity issues are really horrible today. Um, but I just wanted to briefly touch on, so we talked a lot today about policy and policy meaning, you know, bills and programs that are set in place through the state and federal government. Um, and we do recognize that for change, we really need everybody working together on the front of justice um, for safety of our people. And so there are different ways that the general public or, or our loved ones, our family, friends, relatives can get involved in this process and the, you know, the process of legislation in those ways include, you know, staying up to date on legislation and policy by following bills as they move through the legislature. And I really encourage you to utilize available resources like the Alaska State website if you want to follow bills. And if you need any help with how to do that, what a bill is, um, how to follow it, uh, you all of that is available on our website at www.nativepeoplesaction.org at our advocacy tab. 
So I really encourage you to go and check that out. We also encourage folks to get in contact with your legislators. Our legislators are there to represent us. So you can set up a meeting with your legislator or you can let them know that this issue along with other issues are important to you. You can write a letter or call their office or send an email to their office, even to their staff um, who can then get that letter in touch with the legislator. I, I also encourage you to share with others that this is a good process to keep in contact with your legislators and make sure that they know that this issue of MMIWG2S is not something that can be ignored anymore. There are community members throughout Alaska and even our relatives downstates who have been advocating for justice on this front for years. And so um, it's time that we do have policy set in place and that there are ways that we can get involved um, by contacting our legislators and letting them know. You're also able to watch hearings, <clears throat> excuse me, and you can watch committee, meet, committee meetings, whether that's online or on TV, all of those resources are available on our website as well. And then the last thing that I had put on here was communicate with your loved ones and community members. Um, the way that we are going to make change is by being transparent about this issue and talking with our loved ones and our community members about why we need policy protections in place and um, ways that we can really get involved and be an advocate, whether that is, you know, being vocal about it um, on your. All right, we apologize. Looks like we're having a tech issue. I know Kelsey had had a little struggles with her connectivity. Um, and so So one of our next big events coming up would be our canoe journey event. Um, in May, we have a very important event. Um, Heartbeat of the drums and uh, MMIWG 2S Day of Awareness. And you can find all of our information and constantly updated uh, for more information on our uh, event. Excuse me, can I ask uh, participant, participants to please mute? You can mute your device, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so again, thank you all for being here. Uh, Rochelle is going to have some time for question and answers. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And it looks like we don't have any questions from the Facebook end, so um, take it away, Michelle. Yes, Masi Cho. Um, and again, I just want to say Kuyana, Gunal Chish, Chinan to everyone and to, to our working group here, and especially to everyone joining us today. Um, so we have this next slide to. So please take a look, and this is how we the working group and with our organizations. Um, we've seen a lot of connectivity happening in the chat, and just really grateful that you're all here with us. I do want to um, just make a note. We did have um, President Richard Peterson, Chaya uh, Esh, from the Clinket and Haida tribe, and we want to apologize that he wasn't able to make it with us today. Um, so just wanted to let you know um, know that, but we. We do want to open this space up now for any questions, comments, um, for anyone to jump on. We do have um, allotted about 15 minutes for uh, to have some discussion. So I want to open that space up. If anyone feels inclined to um, jump on and unmute themselves, feel free to do so. Otherwise, you can type your question um, in the chat feature. So if you have a question for any of anything that was shared today.
So Ro <clears throat> Rochelle, there is a few questions that are coming through the chat. I know there's um, one person that's up in Palmer and maybe we'll just throw this out to the um, group. If there's anybody in Palmer or know, or is familiar, if there's any meetings um, or gatherings on native issues in that area that um, allies could join. Um, I don't know anybody, but I'll throw that out for anybody to either uh, unmute and, and offer some assistance to our friend in Palmer or um, put that in chat. Yeah, Masicho, I have seen in the past that Kinnick, um has been doing uh, cultural gatherings. I'm not sure if they have any lately, but I would check with, with tribes. Those are a great resource. So I would suggest check, just, you know, calling them, checking in and see if they have any gatherings like that. Okay. I okay. see the last a question by Tia. Um, how do we change the state mental health licensing practice of qualifying important professionals to work with and make decisions about Alaska Natives after watching a four hour video of Alaska Native culture? Not, this is Tia, not important, imported. Oh, thank you, Tia. I think this is Lisa Wade. This is also like the same question that I'm raising. Like, I think we need to do some work around requiring additional education, equity education, and, you know, Alaska Native specific education for people that are coming in that are working um, within our communities. We've been doing equity dialogues with um, city council out here in Palmer and the police chief in Palmer. And there's some embedded stuff that we need to really work on. And I, we have a hard time getting them to the table to do this work. And so that's why I wrote a question about, can we look at maybe some policy language or developing policy language requiring specific um, education and ongoing training for individuals in those safety sensitive positions that are going to be interacting with our people on a regular basis, whether it's through education, through health care, or through the police system. And judges. Yeah, yeah. and oh, sorry, this is Kia again. I have my camera going the wrong way. Um, I was just, it's not, you know, law enforcement and um, the judicial system, it's good for them to be trained on equity issues as well as, you know, hopefully not just telling them they have to do things because it's their job. But there's other people that make important decisions about how um, a healthy community looks. Um, this week I was invited to join a a local group that's working on keeping the kids safe on the Kenai Peninsula. And they asked if we knew anybody else who should be on that board, you know, on these people that are making plans for the future of our community. And I said, ICWA, and the person running the meeting said, is that state or federal? And I thought, oh my God, here we go again. You know, that people in these positions should all have the basic um, information about not only the statistical numbers that bring in the money, but um, the issues that are ongoing and the solutions like ICWA um, that they can turn to as part of a team. Yes, Masi Cho. Um, Kendra, were you jumping in? I just wanted to say, Gunashish, I appreciate that. That's also a policy recommendation that this working group has made um, to our legislators and, you know, kind of with um, some other hats that I wear that we talk about that in some other spaces, you know, there's a, you know, the municipality with the Public Safety Advisory Commission and work and reaching out to um, Chief Dahl and working on that and what kind of policies would be put in place there. But I absolutely agree it should be um, across the board and that yeah I would implore that our you know our legislators or staff that are on the line or people that are watching this um, that is a policy recommendation that's put in and 
looking to organizations that are indigenous led, we have a number of, of trainings. You know, I, I think of First Alaskans often, they have the governance and protocol trainings, um, racial equity dialogues. There are some really great um, individuals, native individuals and organizations that do these trainings. And I'm happy to um, provide anyone with resources that we have from this working group. I know Native Movement has trainings and there's others, there's many others that um, I hope that they do take this recommendation and, and pass it. So it is something that you have to do. Uh -huh, I want to hold space for Robert Sam. He has some uh, questions in here and then we can go to Christy Hansen. Robert, do you want to ask those? So what I've seen in the chat, he asked a couple of questions and- Oh, yes, oh. I do. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to, to listen and witness this very important uh, topic. As a tribal leader, how can tribes become more, more uh, supportive of, of this issue? Uh, this important issue and, and help change policy. And the second question is, is, is it possible to, for state uh, government and tribal governments to come together and discuss this uh, important issue and, and discuss policies so that we can make it more safer for our our citizens here in Alaska. Thank you. Ahamasicho, uh, who'd like to answer? I'll just speak, um, you know, I serve on my tribal council, really appreciate the, the question. I'll just share with you a little bit about what we've started to do. One of the first things we realized was we had to take a hard look at ourselves in terms of being um, uh, an employer and a partner in, in terms of the code of conduct um, that we put into place with our organization. We had a, a situation where there was um, an assault at one of our fundraisers and we had to look hard and so we've started working on a code of conduct that we could share with other tribal councils in our region to uphold what other um, uh, what we expect of our leadership in terms of responding when there are situations where our people are, are unsafe for whatever reason. So that's one thing that Organization um, that way, uh, I can provide that assistance, and then who do we uh, kind of put in charge of that to reach out then to uh, federal or state um, uh, authorities uh, to help track and, and develop some of that work. But I also just put a link in the chat for the Center for Native American Youth, and I think part of the other thing we can do as tribes is help train up uh, our young people in how to. Uh, do this work in a good way and they just launched a new fellowship called remembering our sisters fellowship and applications are available through march 26th but i think it's part of about, uh, Um, what I've seen in the chat, she um, is looking for the, the definition of equity work. And so um, just wanting to kind of explore what that means, you know. With... Hello. Okay. Hi, Christy. I'm so sorry. I was on mute. Um, okay. So, yeah, Christy and she, yeah. 
I'm from the Navajo Nation, and uh, um, my sister was murdered. I've done a lot of work, and then the community, people have lost others. It's sort of like um, either a toolkit for missing people, or like um, if if uh, families have like a an advocate group that they can turn to during their time of crisis. Um, you know, like, I know policy changes are going on, but in the meantime, there are still people going missing. There are still people, uh, you know, whose lives are being stolen from them. So in the meantime, is there something that we can offer um, the public that can help families in need um, through their crisis? Um, it's, okay, so the story goes is that like, well, my sister was murdered. And uh, we were assigned a, um, a crisis sort of advocate, a victim specialist from the FBI. She, you know, was murdered on the Navajo Nation on Indian land. Um, and like the, the victim specialist, like, you know, it wasn't quite what we were expecting. But I did find a really wonderful person. Her name is Deborah Denton, and she's with MMIW USA, which is based out of Portland. And, you know, I've been able to just sort of connect with that uh, nonprofit group. And, you know, they've been extremely supportive throughout the years and, you know, never forgot us, essentially, and have like put out the word on uh, my own sister's case, as well as many countless other cases. Is there something like that that exists in Alaska yet? So, um, this is Deborah, and, and I can share that the Native Women's Resource already put together a toolkit to develop um, its own resources. Um, that, that toolkit is not yet um, available, as, um, of course, we are um, the a, a nonprofit that has federal funders who want um, to be able to review that, and it's right now being um, being reviewed and in, um, in the final editing stages. It should be out and available, and I encourage you to look on our website at Alaska Native Women's Resource Center. Um, you can also sign up on our mailing list and um, be alerted to any um, updates for when that get, is going to get posted. That said, and that's for Alaska specific. We also um, work with lots of other organizations and have come in contact with um, national organizations. Um, Sovereignty Bodies has um, put out a, a um, toolkit, as has um, the Native, uh, the National in Indigenous Women's Resource Center has, um, has put out information about how communities can not just organize within their own communities when somebody has um, been murdered or has um, or is missing and how to go about um, collaborating within, within the community, but also um, collaborating with the local law enforcement and other entities um, that is happening. And that, so it's a two part process. You both um, need to um, know what your resources are within your own community, but you also have to have the means to be able to collaborate with um, law enforcement and other state agencies that um, are then um, able to either I see primary approach has been to um, do that um, development of protocols with law enforcement so that law enforcement knows how to effectively work with the community, which has been a problem. Um, law enforcement um, has not historically been very um, um, trained or able to communicate effectively um, with families and or communities. And I think the uh, protocols that um, the task force has been putting together is going to be instrumental in, in helping to bridge some of those gaps. So 
Um, thank you for the question, Christy. I think it's an ongoing, there's not any one tool that can be applied universally, um, but there certainly is um, um, a sense of, of everybody wants to be able to solve the murder and or find somebody who's missing. And if we all come to the table together, um, putting aside our biases and our, our um, 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 well, biases is, a, is sometimes a big um, stumbling block or challenge, but um, if we can get everybody who needs to be at the table at the table working together, then that's the first step. So thanks for the question, Christy. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to, do you want to tell us what share? Oh, yeah, I think Malia and I were sharing various national uh, toolkits that are available. So those are some uh, links there. And thank you, Deborah, for sharing that. And yes, Ingrid is a wonderful resource. And then also for community level organizing, the reason we share so much of these webinars and put everything on Facebook and our websites um, is because we, we, wanted, we want to be transparent so that communities can pick up this work in a way that makes sense for them. And so people ask us a lot about our organizing and the community events that we hold. And we share that out really widely so that exactly for what you're talking about. So um, yeah, I'll just hand it back and that's what we had put in the chat. Yes, Quiana. Okay, so um, in closing, I'm going to be passing it over to in each other in this work and um, to hold space for Indigenous people doing this work and for each other. So Masit Cho, with that I'm going to pass it over uh, to our sister Yari to close us out. Real quick, can I ask a question? Um, it's being recorded, but how can we share this to a larger audience? Um, yes, this is being recorded. We also have links uh, to contact us. Um, follow, uh, you can contact Native Peoples Action and Native Movement. Uh, we do have all of our organizations on the MMIWG2S Alaska Facebook page. I know we'll be sharing this recording on uh, those Facebook pages as well. So, yeah, so um, Kuyana, um, and feel free to reach out to us as well. I know there's a lot of questions, a lot of discussion happening here, and we really appreciate that. And we wanna make sure that we, everyone has a chance to have their voices heard. So please reach out to us. And um, so with that, I'm turning it over to Yari, Kriana Yari. Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you everybody for joining us. It means a whole lot to us that you are able to join us today take the time in, to be with us today for this very important topic here. In closing, I'd like to say, I pray for peace for all of you. I pray for love for all of you. I pray for guidance for all of you. May you be well and may you be loved. And I wanna remind you that when you do your work, everyday work, whether it's in your personal life or work or school, Remember to take care of yourself and remember to always put good thoughts and energy in everything you do every single day because energy can be passed on. I wanna sing a song to the ladies who do this important work here for each of you guys. I wanna lift you up in this song. And I know I sang the song before, but this song goes to each of you who work on this topic here because we do carry a lot in, in this type of work. So this song was composed by the late Theodore Gallagher, and this song is called Ki Una. And this, when he composed the song, he saw a beautiful woman in his dream who had really long hair. And that's what his song was about, this beautiful woman with a really long hair. 
And this song goes to each of you guys. Ki Una by Theodore Lagerman. Ki Una da was a yokdone, eya anagaro ang eya. Ki Una da was a yokdone, eya anagaro ang eya. Ana rako ngaya biner nekloneng ayang 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 so again, that song goes to each of you ladies that work in this field. And I also want to say, I do work for the Alaska Native Hair Center for our Umuwat program. And we do have an upcoming event. And I'm going to ask you guys to please look out for that flyer. It's for our, our broader Native community. We will do a smudging event. and. Look out for it on our Alaska Native Heritage Center Facebook page. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you next time.